But Christmas stereotypes are something that we all probably have encountered at some point or another, and we thought that it would be really funny this series to talk about the awkwardness of Christmas. We thought, what could be something that would be relatable to every single person? And one of the things that's relatable is that we often find ourselves at Christmas times in situations with families that are awkward. So therefore, we call it Awkward Family Christmas. But the more we got to thinking about it, the more we realized that you can actually find a lot about how God wants us to love one another and how God loves us by looking at those awkward situations. So you remember the first week... Everything's been a little bit lighthearted, and uh, it's going to stay lighthearted today, but as you know, we take it from the light to the serious, right? So the first week we talked about the gift no one wanted, and we talked about those gifts that can sometimes make it awkward at Christmas, particularly the ones Grandma gets you, right? But here's the deal. Uh, we recognize that Jesus is often the gift that people overlook, right? And then last week, Pastor West talked about that one family member. You know, the one family member that you know when they come for Christmas or when you go to their place, everybody's going to be trying to work around and manage their crazy. You know what I'm talking about. You know the family member, right? Well, today, I, I want to just take a few minutes and talk to you about a little bit of a situation that I have often found myself in at Christmas time. And the situation was something like this. I have really cool cousins. Anybody else have cool cousins in here? There you go. Somebody, somebody would be willing to give their cousins uh, some love. Uh, don't, well, I better be careful how I say that. We don't want kissing cousins. But um, people, I had cool cousins. And here was the thing. They were cool for a variety of reasons. Some of them were cool because they were a couple years older than me. So just by virtue of the fact of somebody being a couple grade levels up from you, that just makes them cool. Some of them were cool because their clothes were cooler than me. Some of my cousins were cool because they played sports better than me. And a lot of my cousins were cool because they had more high-tech and better video games than I had. Can anybody identify with me in here? So here's the thing. I would want to go to Christmas every single year knowing that I would see my cool cousins. And I would want to impress them. I would want them to think I was as cool as I thought they were cool. I wanted to wear the new clothes, you know, the ones that I had just opened that morning from my mom. I'd want to go get all the tags off and wear those clothes. I would want to tell them about how good I was doing at sports. I wanted to tell the guys about all the girls I've been chasing. You know what I'm saying. You know, I had to <laughs> brag a little bit about that. But anyway, I wanted them to think I was impressive. I wanted them to think I was cool. And quite often in those family situations, it gets a little bit awkward because you just, when somebody's trying to look cool, okay, you just end up looking dumber than you tried to look from the beginning, right? When somebody's trying too hard. But here's what I realized. That that may have been something that I was going through as a kid, but adults do it too. All the time. They do it at Christmas. They do it all around. All year round, they want to impress people. They want people to think that they are something better than what they are. So at any given Christmas gathering, you're going to hear all manner of one-upping, humble brag. You ever heard of the humble brag? We're going to talk about that. And just parents thinking that their way of parenting is downright superior to everybody else's. All right, You'll hear these kind of things going on. What's a one-up sound like? Well, it sounds something like this. Man, I'm so glad. I'm so proud of my son. He just got his first hit in baseball. Oh, really? My son just got his first home run in baseball. Just saying. Just saying. And then somebody says, well, I'm so proud of my daughter because she got into the college she always wanted to get into. Somebody says, well, I'm proud of my daughter because Ivy League schools are fighting over her and she can't decide which school she wants to go to. That's the one-upping that we often have in human interactions when we're wanting people to think we're something more than we are. And then there's the humble brag, and this one's classic. This is the one where everybody looks around, and they don't say it in the form of a brag, but you know they mean it as a brag. You know that one family member, she stands by the food, she's like, oh, man, I'm so hungry. I wish I could gain weight. My metabolism is just so fast. I just can't do it. <laughs> Have you ever tried to go shopping for extra smalls? It is like the worst. I cannot find anything. 
or then the guy that had a particularly good year in business, and he's sitting there saying, it's like, I love my new BMW, but the thing is, every time I'm on the road, I'm getting pulled over so much more often. It's so annoying. It's the humble brain. It's the humble brain. But then there's that third one, and Valerie and I usually get a big kick out of this one when we we'll look around at other parents, and parents will be looking at us, and they'll want to talk about their method of parenting and just how great it is, and they'll say things like, well, you know, we feed our kids kale chips. <laughs> and we make sure our kids get plenty of vitamin C. Valerie and I are like, our kids get all the vitamin C they need out of Mountain Dew, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you right now, yellow five is a vitamin. I don't care what they say, it is. It is absolutely a vitamin. But then, but then there's other things. You know, we, we, only, we only discipline our kids through positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement. And we're like, we look at our kids and we say, I'm bigger than you. You have to do what I say. That's how we discipline our kids. So you can, you can have all these kinds of situations where everybody's trying to one-up each other while everybody is trying to present something. And here's the basic message we're wanting to say to everybody. We're wanting to look at everybody and go, everything is perfect. Everything's fine. What you see on the Christmas card is the reality. Now, the Christmas jammies, I totally agree with that video. Those are so awkward. If you do them, that's okay. Send me the card still, but they're so awkward. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Everything's perfect. We want people to believe this. And the basic self-messaging, that not that we're sending other people, but that we're sending ourselves when we're looking at everybody and going, this is what I want you to see. Here's what we're telling ourselves. I am not enough. I am not enough. I need to prove my worth to you. I need you to see how worthy I am. So I'm going to give you the picture I want you to have. But here's the good news that I came to tell you today. Matthew chapter 9 verses 12 through 13. Jesus was constantly being criticized all throughout his ministry for hanging out with the lowly, the sinful, the broken, the outcast of society. And he was often finding himself having to defend why he would hang out with such people. And he says these words, starting here, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Now, now, here is the beautiful truth for you today. God didn't come for perfect people who have it all together. God came for the broken, imperfect people who are willing to admit that they need a Savior. That's who He came for. Let's go deeper with this problem for a second. We need to own up to the fact and acknowledge that Christians can be some of the worst perpetrators of this. We are the ones who want people to think we have it all together. We're the ones who struggle. How much do we struggle with perfectionism? Again, it goes back to the things we tell ourselves in our heart of hearts. We struggle with perfectionism. We want people to see a perfect little life. Once again, what is the message? I'm going to repeat this multiple times throughout this sermon. I am not enough. Over and over again, we're saying I am not enough because my validation does not come from who I am. My validation doesn't come from who God says I am. I get my validation from you. I need you to think that I'm valuable. I need you to think that I have worth. And that's how I feel validated. So what are the behaviors that often these people end up manifesting? When I say these people, I mean me. What are the behaviors that we end up displaying when we have that mentality? Well, for one thing, we can display the behavior of being a yes person. There's something behind your incessant need to say yes all the time. And primarily what is behind that is the fact that you need to feel wanted. You need to feel valued. So you will say yes at any opportunity anybody throws you. Why? Because as long as they're asking, that means somebody needs you. 
That means somebody wants you. And what's happening there? You're getting your validation from someone else. You're getting your validation from what they think about you. Now, there could be another end of the spectrum. It looks like the opposite end of the spectrum. Over here, you have people who say yes all the time. On this end of the spectrum, there are people who just get plain scared and never say yes to anything and never try anything different. And what is happening with these people is they're so afraid of failure and that they are going to disappoint people that they never try anything. Because after all, if you don't try, you don't fail. And so I want to stay over here settled where it's safe. But I want you to notice something. Although these look like two opposite ends of the spectrum, they are in fact the same exact self-message. And it's this, I am not enough. If I say yes all the time so that you'll validate me, so that I can prove my worth, so that you'll think I'm something, then I am not enough. If I'm over here and I'm so scared and I never try anything because I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you and I'm afraid I'm going to be a failure, so I'm going to protect myself, I still think that I am not enough. See, that is not, my friends, a healthy sense of who we are. You see, one is talking about your value based on what you do. Your value based on what you contribute, what you produce. But do you know what Christianity says? You know what the gospel is? Your value is in doing. Your value is in being. Two huge, hugely different concepts. Doing says what I can produce, what I can show on the outside gives me value. Being says no because of who I am and whose I am, I have value. Amen. Period. End of discussion. And then what I do begins to flow out of who I am. Now this gets particularly twisted, friends, when we bring religion into it. When we bring religion into it, it all becomes about keeping up with everybody else's righteousness. Keeping up with how holy we perceive everybody else to be. You see, I was raised with a performance-based idea of religion. You gotta look right, you gotta act just this way, and you gotta perform just this way. And if you do, you must be righteous. Now, those things weren't always said like that to us, but that's how we grew to believe it because those were the things that were modeled in front of us. So if you didn't look just right, if there was something off in how you looked, then you must not be as righteous as the one who has the part down. If you didn't perform just right, then you must not be as righteous as the one who could get up on a stage and sing or preach and move a crowd. You're probably not as righteous as the one who's cleaning toilets. But what you don't know is that when cleaning toilets is loving on people and having more of an impact in people's lives than the one up there moving a crowd. And so, but the mentality of a performance-based understanding of religion is the one that gets the crowd going is the most righteous. That is a twisted view of the gospel. And I'm going to tell you what it does to young people. This is why we would always guard against this, is it turns them into a bunch of little imposters and copycats and fakes that look at everybody else and figure out, oh, if I behave this way, the, the, the higher-ups are going to like me. Now, maybe you haven't struggled with that in the church. Maybe that's how you are in your day-to-day -day life with your bosses, with other professional people that you're in business with. Maybe if I just perform, somebody is going to find value in me. Now, people who struggle with this absolutely hate accountability. They hate the idea that someone would come to them and give them suggestions or helpful criticism or just hold them accountable for something because they feel like any attack on anything they do or any word against anything they do is an attack directly on them. Why? Because I am not enough. Because my value is in what I do and what I can show you. So if your comments for me so you got to learn this real quick when you're a preacher because people got all kind of comments about stuff you say when you preach. 
And my self-identity has to be healthy enough to know who I am in God so that if you've got a little tweak or something to say about my preaching or a certain way that I did it, that's not, that's just information. That is not an attack on who I am because I know who I am. I'm God's. And there is no words that anybody can say that can make me doubt that. So here's the deal. We get ourselves in a place where we are so afraid of accountability because that means that you're attacking me. Or, put it to you this way, people who are in this kind of imposter way of thinking absolutely would rather die than, you, than for you to see who they really are behind the mask. They don't want you to see what's behind the mask. Why? Because they live with this reality every single day. If people really knew who I was, they wouldn't love me. If they really knew my brokenness, they would reject me. So I have to protect myself. And I have to keep the mask on. Because if the mask doesn't stay, then people will withdraw their love. And that's a pain that I can't bear to take. And so I'm going to keep the mask on because I can't let you see who I really am. Friends, if people leave when you take the mask off, let them leave. They're not your friend. But we're mortified. We live terrified of people finding out our brokenness. We don't want to be found out. The message is I am not enough because no one would want who I really am. But I say to you again, friends, Jesus wants who you really are. In fact, Jesus desires. Jesus came to save who you really are. He died not for the mask. He died for the one that's hiding behind the mask. He doesn't even recognize that mask. He loves so much more than you could ever imagine the person that you think is so ugly behind that mask. The Bible gives us a simple life-giving message that confronts all this nonsense of not feeling like we're adequate. Here it is. It comes from Psalm 139. Look there with me. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 14. We'll bring that up on the screen. The psalmist David is going to give you a message that you need to hear. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That I know very well. Now, friends, if this psalm can't give you a healthy sense of identity, I don't know what can. What message is the psalmist David sending to himself? Now, I know he's speaking directly to God. But I want you to understand that your words flow from who you are and your identity. And his words are flowing out of an understanding, not just of who God is, but his words are flowing out of an understanding of who he is. So where is David saying to us that his value lies? Notice, his value lies in being created by God carefully in his image, in his mother's womb. Not only does his value lie in the fact that he is a special creation of God, but his value is also in the fact that he looks at the works of God's hands and he says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made and wonderful are your works, Lord. Amen. Who's he talking about? He's talking about himself. This psalmist, David, was coming to a place of a healthy self-identity. Call it what you want. But he was coming to a place where he realized that it's not a sin to love what God has made. That it's not a sin to love who God made you to be. In fact, friends, one of the things that is assumed in Christ's command for us to love each other, you know what it is? <clears throat> 
He said, you love your neighbor like you love who? Yourself. One of the reasons I believe you may be struggling to love people in your life is because you haven't accepted who you are yet. You haven't learned to agree with God about what He thinks about you yet. God looks at you and sees a precious child for whom He sent His most precious gift to redeem. And His love for you is without measure and it is unconditional and it is never ending. But the problem is you don't agree with Him about how much worth He sees in you. You're disagreeing with God. Every time you think about yourselves, you know that, you know, most statistics are made up on the spot, right? But, however, I did read this one, and I believe it's accurate. <clears throat> that 70 to 80% of the thoughts we think about ourselves are negative. And every time you think in that way, you are disagreeing with God about who you are. Did you know, how would you react if you knew that one of your children didn't know how much they were loved by you? Think of, if you don't have children, think of a, of a brother, a sister, a mom, or a dad, a best friend. And think of how sad you would be if they didn't know how much you loved them. And if they questioned that you loved them. Now I want you to think of what you do, friends, to the Father's heart when you look at yourself as this useless, unworthy person that has to put a mask on for everybody. Imagine if it were your children and how much it would break your heart. Think of how much it breaks His heart when He sees you striving and trying to prove to everybody else how much worth you have. When all along He's been telling you, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Why? Why do you need more? Why are you looking for validation from everybody else? That's how I would feel if it were my children. I'd want to say to them, Mom and Dad love you. Mom and Dad absolutely adore you. Why would you need to get validation somewhere else? That's how God feels. That's how His heart breaks. What you're simply saying is not cockiness when you look at God. You just say, I am enough. I am enough because God is enough. I am enough because Christ in me is enough and I have no right to question God's design, His image in me. Friends, when you finally get this, by God's grace, you will have peace with yourself you never thought possible. There's a psychological theory called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. If you've ever had basic psychology, you've, you've learned this. Now, this is not the gospel. And we're not going to treat it like the gospel. But it does comport with truth. And so that's why I bring it up. In this idea of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he talks about this thing that a healthy adult does, and it's called self-actualization. Now, I know I just risked losing all of you by using psychological jargon, so please, please just hang on with me for a second, because this is helpful. This is this point that he talks about where an adult gets to a place where they begin to leave what he calls deficient needs behind. Now, what these deficient needs are is what we've been talking about. The need for people's approval. The need to find their worth from other people. The healthy adult finally gets to the place where they actualize them, themselves. They say, I don't need those things to feel value. I don't need to go around proving my worth all the time. Finding it in others. I have found it within myself. Now, this is not the gospel, but here's what the gospel says. The gospel says that you have found your worth in Christ. And you don't need, just like Maslow's theory says, the approval of other people. And this is what Maslow said. It's at this point that you really become that person society needs you to be. Because you stop thinking about yourself so often and you're able to turn it outward towards others. You know those people who are down on themselves all the time, really it's another form of selfishness. And, and, I, and I hate to say it that way, but it's because they think about themselves all the time. 
Self-loathing is still thinking about self all the time. And what Maslow was pointing out is that if you can get to the point, not that you think less of yourself, notice the distinction, but you just think about yourself less. And you start turning towards other people. He says that's the point where you can really do some good in the world. Anybody who thinks about themselves all the time and obsesses about what other people think about them is going to have a hard time leading anything. But you're going to have a hard time contributing to society if you cannot get to the point where you move beyond that. Now here is where this comports beautifully with God's truth of the gospel. I want to give you the words of the Apostle Paul. And Paul was a man who, if there was anybody in Christianity who had a reason to boast, it was him. Why? Because he was one of the most educated Jews of his day. Went to the best rabbinical school. Came up through the ranks as a young man and was able to establish himself as a recognized teacher in Judaism. Was considered of the Pharisee class. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was from good stock. He had every reason in the world to boast. He could have hid behind all of his accomplishments for the rest of his life. And he could have had a happy, healthy life behind those accomplishments. But here is what Paul said in Galatians 2, 19 through 20. I, focus on that word for just a second. I, this is in the second line. When he says I, that means everything about me that has made me what people perceive me to be, everything that is hidden, everything that anybody never knew about me, but also those things that I wanted to present, all of me, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now friends, I want you to think about what the Apostle Paul is teaching us. He got to the place where although he could boast about all these things, he said in Philippians chapter 3 that he counted them all as just dung or rubbish to be thrown away. It's funny to me that I watch Christian preachers who would say that Paul would be an example of theirs. Who, prior to Paul's life, he had everything. He had all the recognition. He had all the fame and the glory. And then I watch Christians who, after coming to Christ, want to achieve all those things. Paul had it all. He left it behind. He got to the place where self meant so little that he could say that it had died with Christ. He says later on in that letter, he says, the life I now live, it's in Christ and my life is hidden with Christ in God. Do you know what the man realized? The man realized that his worth was not in himself. It was not in what he had accomplished. It was not in the things he had done that his worth was entirely shown to him in the cross. Now, did he go on and do good things? Absolutely. He changed the world by God's grace. He evangelized the entire known world. The greatest missionary that the church has ever known. But he, listen, friends, he did not do those things to show his worth. He did those things out of the purpose of who God made him to be. He established first, this is who I am, and out of that, the works came. Friends, it must not be backwards. It must not be the works show you who you are. No, it must be that you know who you are, and then out of that, you can begin to do good. Friends, can I tell you what a sweet spot that is to be in? If you've ever been there and you know that when you get up in the mornings, you are not operating out of, i got to keep this one happy, i got to keep that one happy, and I better make sure that I stay in this one's good graces. When you're able to operate out of, I am walking out my purpose. 
That's my motivation. That's the sense of self that I have within myself. That I'm walking in a purpose-driven life. Friends, that can be your revelatory, your defining moment where that switches in your mind. But you have to take the mask off first. It can't happen until you're willing to own your brokenness. Until you're willing to realize that who God made you to be from this moment on, you are going to minister through your brokenness, not in spite of it. That God is going to use it, that He is going to redeem it, but you've got to be honest about it first because we need the real you. Friends, I want you to come out of hiding today. 